You're listening to The Artist Athlete, episode 105. This podcast is dedicated to circus. It's a place for professionals in the industry to share their stories, viewpoints, and information, and a place for outsiders to get a sneak peek into this world. Hey, friends, fans, and foes. I'm Shannon McKenna. I'm the host of the Artist Athlete Podcast and the founder of theartistathlete.com. This week is a very special week for me because my good friend Rachel Strickland is on the podcast. She is my guest. I will read her bio in just a moment, but I just want to give a heads up. Rachel and I are really good friends, so this interview may sound a little different because if you noticed, and this has happened in the past as well, people I know better or more intimately, I tend to joke around with a little bit more, um, and the, the vibe is just a little different than when there's a more formal interview situation happening. However, a lot of y'all I know are big fans of Rachel Strickland, and so on my Patreon and her Patreon, probably, I think, definitely, maybe, will be the video of this recording. That's right, the Artist Athlete Podcast is starting to come out with video of some of the episodes. And for now, as we're running trials of it, I really only want to put it out to Patreons until we kind of have a better system for it, if a system makes sense. But Patreon is the place where I test drive things. It's where I put out content that nobody else gets to see. And so if you are a Patreon, which means you are helping out the podcast by giving small amounts of money each week so that I can cover my bills, then go to patreon.com slash theartistathlete and you can watch Rachel and I be ridiculous fools, not just listen. There's now a visual aspect to our foolery as well. Again, www.patreon.com slash theartistathlete. As I just mentioned, my guest today is Rachel Strickland. Rachel Strickland is a performing artist, award-winning choreographer, and development coach to artists and creative entrepreneurs. Classically trained in ballet since the age of three, she began her study of circus arts in 2007, developing a unique style and innovative approach to aerial hoop. Her work brought her international recognition, and she has coached, performed, and choreographed on four continents. She is the director of the Audacity Project, an eight-week guided process to equip artists and creatives with the tools necessary to be working professionals. RachelStricklandCreative.com is the website, and here is my interview with Rachel Strickland. Rachel Strickland, (laughs) welcome to the Artist Athlete Podcast. Shannon McKenna, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Oh my gosh, the delight is all mine. Um, can you tell the people, who who are you, Rachel? What do you do? Okay, hi people. I'm Rachel and I am a, a performance artist in the mediums of circus arts, movement and storytelling. And I also work as a coach and a mentor through a program called The Audacity Project where I equip artists and creatives with the tools necessary to be working professionals. And yes, I did have that memorized. Yes. Really? You weren't reading it? Right. That's amazing. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) It's part of the program, so I have to do it too. Really? Yeah. The part part of the program is to memorize what people... It's so funny. We talk, full disclosure, Rachel and I talk every Monday. Every Monday. As kind of like a business artist, keep on track, keep your life together kind of thing. Um, But I actually don't... like. I don't really know that much about the Audacity <laughs> Project from like a practical st- – like I know a lot about you going through it, like you taking people through it. Right. But um, that maybe explain like what the Audacity Project is for people who don't okay. know what it is. I mean aside from it equips artists with tools and – I haven't memorized what it is. Right. It equips artists and creatives with the tools necessary to be working yes. professionals. 
So what tools do you consider necessary? Well, there's a lot of things that we cover. Uh, uh, the, the better version of the declaration that I gave to you is that I help artists and creatives get their shit together. And some of the shit that they need to have together <laughs> is materials that accurately reflect the work that they want to be doing and themselves as artists, as well mm. as necessary systems for expanding their community, utilizing the community they already have, and just tools to put in place to support them as they grow so that you don't wake up one day and you're in a big giant rut. You've been there for five years. Oh. How did the Audacity Project begin? It started because I I was hosting a lot of workshops and building workshops and teaching at uh, Circus Arts. I was like, you know what would be really great? If we could sit down and have a roundtable discussion about best practices for people making the transition from amateur to professional or those who were already working that wanted to work more and get better work, more fulfilling work. So it started as a hour and a half conversation around a table that I think I charged $30 for it. And there were maybe eight people there, mm -hmm. which was super fun. Uh, and from there it grew into a, a two hour workshop and then it was a three hour workshop and then it was a two day workshop. And I would follow people who took it um, for about a year and just ask like, how's it going? How's your life? How's your career? Wow. And what I felt like was that I like the material was good and people would always leave feeling really inspired, but two hours wasn't enough to make a really lasting change that would have been super effective for them. So that's when I okay. said, fuck it and made it eight weeks long. And now it's eight weeks long. <laughs> yeah. You know, from two hours to eight weeks, that's you're right. just like, you know what? Here, <laughs> let's go all the way. That's amazing. And so what, what is the outcome of the Audacity Project? Who have you had? What have they done? I've had uh, almost 200 souls march through my gates. Wow. Um, I think I started at eight at a time. Right now I can take up to 20. Uh, so it's still a pretty intimate community altogether. Um, so instead of reading you 200 names, which I wouldn't do anyway, you know, to protect their privacy you. <laughs> and your sanity. <laughs> yeah. But the, the answer to the question is, of what have they done is super subjective to what it was that they set out to do. Mm. Is they've, they've created courses and they've sold out retreats and they've had children and they've designed shows and toured them. And yes, they've gotten hired by Cirque du Soleil and Seven Fingers because everyone asks. So, yeah, that happens too, but not everyone wants to do that. How did you create something? I mean, it feels like it, in one set, and I know we talk about this a lot, like that circus, or maybe this is just a thing that I have where circus feels like this very narrow thing or this very small community. Mm -hmm. And yet within it, as you're saying, like there's so many things that you can do within the community. You can oh, teach, yeah. you can give retreats you can how do you how do you have a program that kind of helps people figure out what they want to do or like assists them in all those different things well it's a kind of built from the inside out because the most imperative piece of information to get from anyone is what do you want to do and for a lot of people they've never really been asked that question and and like had someone actually answering or listening to the answer. You know, people mm. think, what do you want to do? What are you going to do with that? Okay, good luck. But not like, what do you want to do? Let's build a map to get there. So that's the most important question. Uh, and everything else is built on top of the answers to those questions. So if someone wants to like smear fake blood on themselves and roll around inside of a Corvette full of jello, then that's the foundation that we start out with and everything else is built to support that vision, which I just made up. No one's actually said that. I would like to smear the fake blood and roll in the Corvette. <laughs> I, I, I you, didn't know that's what I wanted, but now that's what I want to do. <laughs> you can have that. Thank you. 
Thank you for telling me what I wanted and also that I could have it. Anytime. Audacity project done. <laughs> Sorted. <laughs> you nailed it. So all these people come to you and how do you know which ones to take? This is a very good question. Um, Thank you. The prerequisites are not that many. It's basic competence in your discipline. You can be very experienced or you can be a little experienced, but basic competence just for safety's sake in your discipline. Um, you have to be hungry for something. You have to actually want something. Mm. Without desire, I am not helpful at all. Program's not helpful. And you have to have internet access and access to a computer. And you have to be willing, or not willing, you have to be able to pay for the cost of the program without suffering or hurting your quality of life. Hmm. And there's something... How do you measure desire? Oh, sorry, I interrupted. That, that's okay. How do I... Uh, that, but the second question is so juicy. I've totally forgotten whatever I else I was going to say. How do you, how do you measure <laughs> desire? Um, yeah, like you said, like they have to have a desire. They've got to be hungry. Because I know people who say they have a desire. They're like, oh, man, I really want to start a podcast. Oh, man, I really want to be a circus artist. And I'm like, oh, really? Okay. And I give them things that I know, mm -hmm. and then they never do anything with them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, And to me, that says that they don't have a desire. That's sometimes, Maybe that's a little harsh of me. Not necessarily. Like Sometimes there's just so many other factors at play like mm. and and there's just a lot going on under the surface that may be preventing action be from being taken but at, at any rate they're still like not ready for you at that point and how i know if someone has enough desire to be ready to work with me is like the whole process of applying for the audacity project is is kind of a vetting process like it's not an insignificant amount of cost. Um, it requires a reading. You have to have read enough about it to be engaged with the material and interested in it and be willing to fill out an application and have a conversation with a stranger and all of these things. If, if you don't want something, if you're not quite ready to take action on something, those are roadblocks that are intentionally set up because if you're, if you're not ready, then you're not ready. And that's fine. But if there's enough, one of, oh my God, what, what's her name? Hannah Blackwell, gorgeous, audacious one. Um, what she said was, my hunger overcame my fear when she, uh, when she applied to the Audacity Project. I thought that was quite beautiful. Rachel, I'm going to ask you to take your headphones out actually really quick. I want to see if I can get better audio from you. We'll be fine with the audio we have, but. Is this better? Talk to me. Is it better? Is it better? Say more. More words? Oh, yeah. It's better. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Way better. Ah, excellent. Oh, good. I kind of felt like I was listening to you through an aquarium or something. Oh, shit. Oh, this is so good. Okay, good. Yes. So what you're telling me is basically you're playing hard to get. The way you figure out if people are ready to work with you is if they can jump through all the hoops to sign up for the Audacity Project. <laughs> Uh, hard to get. I don't, I don't know. I still feel pretty easily accessible. Um, mm. but it's definitely like a process designed to attract people who are ready to do the work mm. and it's designed to, to reward them like immediately. You're like, fill out an application. Sure. More things are going to happen right away, you know, to, to create gotcha. a sense of productive forward momentum, which is really desirable which is all any of us really want as artists right what's the next two inches you don't need a five-year plan you need a two-inch plan mm. sometime it's true this is good what's the next two inches? good what does what does audacity mean to you okay this is such a good question uh, because audacity let me think okay audacity is like the uh, the quality of boldness or courage needed to take action what we can assume so but it's not just that or i would have called it like the boldness project or the courage project and i didn't i chose the audacity project because there's like a a whiff of impertinence to the word 
it's presumed that the boldness and action being taken is outside the normal range of what's deemed by silent social cues to be in your lane. Because talent's really kind of a double-edged <laughs> sword. Yeah? Yeah, because it it's great to have it, but an emotional talent tends to go really far where a physical talent can sometimes be limiting because it's it's like a nice cozy laurel to rest on like a, hmm. a sofa or a love seat i think it's great when hmm. people have it but without without work talent is just potential energy how did you get audacious enough to start the audacity project i mean you kind of mentioned like the the nuts and bolts between behind how it was created mm -hmm. um started as a workshop it became like this eight week thing but why you this is such a good question um and i think you know necessity is the mother of invention I'm not saying the world just totally needed me or whatever but for for whatever reason people would come to me and ask me questions and maybe it's because I would actually give them answers instead of telling them to go away or figure it out on their own or do what I could to. And I remember knowing nothing and making so many mistakes along the way that could have been totally avoided if help had been available or if I had been willing to ask for it which I wasn't mm. necessarily. So I don't know why well, I guess I, we could ask them. Why me? <laughs> <laughs> why did you ask me? Well, I'm happy to answer. I mean, I, th I mean, I guess I just think this because I know so many people who they don't seem to be able to do what you do, which is somehow get the information that those people got to succeed in the industry to other people. And circus is an interesting industry in that like, there does seem to be this odd educational barrier of entry. Indeed. Yeah. There's so much. Where you can have. Go ahead. You can have physical mastery over skills and yet still not have a very good career because you don't know who you don't know or you don't know the landscape. You don't know the market. You don't, there are so many other things to know than just how to be a circus artist. It's so true. And being good doesn't get you work. This is no. recording, right? I mean, being good doesn't get you work. <laughs> it's a totally different skill. Set. Neither does being bad. Neither, does being bad. however, but accurate, accurate point from Shannon McKenna. <laughs> but it's just it's such a different skill set. And as several times on calls with students, when they were being like onboarded into the project, say, "Can I ask you a personal question?" I'm like, of course. They say, "Why are you doing this?" I think it's so awesome that you're doing it, but, but like, why, <laughs> like, why are you, why are you helping people do this? Like, I love doing it. I want to live in a jungle full of crazy, interesting plants and animals. The metaphor is they are the plants and animals. And so are we. And I don't want to just live in a jungle with one kind of tree. And if I can help facilitate that happen, why on earth wouldn't I? Yes. Yeah. Come on, ecosystem. Yeah, diversity. Uh, what seems to be interesting about that, though, is this whole idea, and I love, I help people get their shit together, right? Helping people get their marketing shit together, helping people understand that side. How do you foster a diverse, creative group of artists and also help them face the cold, harsh reality of the market, which is that auditions happen and one person is selected or certain looks get certain parts. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you contend with these two kind of facets that are both, I mean, I would argue whether one of them is necessary, but they're both very real and part of the world we exist in. They're both very real. Yeah. And part of the answer to this is a matter of philosophy because it would mm. be super easy to coach people to make work and a presence for themselves that would 
get them hired by this or that company, like with the correct amount of research and training. That could be a thing, but I do not support pandering. And I, I don't encourage people to approach their career through the lens of, I want to work for this one particular company. How can I make myself desirable to them? Like, and the thing is that that will, that can totally work. It can work. It can be rewarding and you can get work with that company. And then it's 15 years later and you're like, I wonder what I would have made if I hadn't been designing myself to someone else's specifications. I wonder what's under that rock I never looked under. I don't want to pick up the rock because mm. I think under the rock is the place to be. So like p- part of the answer is just a matter of philosophy, like authenticity over, over pandering or um, I'm sorry, I can't think of a better word to use than that. I don't like the negative connotation to it because it's so judgmental. I mean, I don't mind a judgmental person who has a point of view on my podcast. I'm here for it. <laughs> Um, but I see what you mean. Like it's that, and I've had people on the show before who have had great success in certain ways. Um, but those, and what I mean is like, their goal is to go to Cirque du Soleil. They go to Cirque du Soleil, right. you know, like they, their goal is to do the thing. They do the things to get to that thing. And, but usually those people are, yeah, like they're not really in service to circuses and art so much as like, what's, what's going to, what is it going to take to get them to this festival? Mm -hmm. What are the moves that they need? Who are the people they need to know? All of that. Yeah. So again, it's like, I guess my question is, is like, if you have someone who is an artist or aspires to be, I mean, I, I, I think we both think like, we're all kind of baseline artists and like, we're just building the body of work to prove it. If you're making art, you're an artist. Ipso facto, right? (laughs) I actually don't know if that's the correct use of ipso facto. (laughs) something that people miss is like when you're an artist you are the product that you're selling in very capitalistic terms like if you are the product like you can be a product that may not fit in the in the market that you want to sell it in and so is the best thing to do to change the market or to change the product Uh, expand one's awareness of the market Mm. it's like there's no end to the weird stuff you can do and get paid for right (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> if you think you're too weird for the market you just need a bigger view of the market because there's there's a seat for every arse what do you do um in your market where are you as as an audacity as a leader of audacious ones we've talked a lot about how you get through that how you do that how you help people with that mm. um what do you do artistic rachel Oh, artistic Rachel. Okay. Put on yeah, yeah, Rachel yeah. Hat. Um, so with the advent of uh, the end times, which I don't think are the end times, but they certainly are. Oh, you mean the... the I, I do. The pandemic? Yeah. Uh, that. Yeah. Um, so uh, it was interesting because in August of 2019... I said, I don't want to get on a plane for a year. I just want to be in one place, which had never happened to me as an adult. I hadn't gone three months without getting on a plane, which is great. But I just wanted to be still like, and I just want to develop my own work. And then a few months later, 2020 super helped me out with that because nobody went anywhere (laughs) for a very long time. Um, so I, I definitely met my goal of not getting on a plane for a year. And within that time, I did devote myself to the projects that were sort of lurking in the in in the muck, in the primordial stew, which is the creative process. So I got to give some of those a body. And uh, I post all of this probably too much, probably TMI amount of things on the Patreon that I run. But that's the avenue that I use to talk about my creative work and where that is and where we're going with that. (laughs) And here's how I utterly botched that experiment. Footage. 
Has has having a Patreon, I don't think I've talked to anybody else about Patreon either, even though I have one as well. Patreon.com slash the artist athlete. Um, and yours is Rachel Strickland? Rachel Strickland Creative. Rachel Strickland Creative. Patreon.com slash Rachel Strickland Creative. Thank you, Shannon. Amazing. What's it like to have a Patreon? It's... We use it in very different ways. We do. First of all. Yeah. Yes. And... And you as you said, like are very, like you interface with your fans a lot. Your friends, fans and foes. Friends, fans and foes. Like you said the word fans and I'm like, Oh, I don't know. I know. <laughs> you know interface words. with your patrons a lot. I do. Um, do you keep any secrets from them? Are there any like, like, wh- because to me, there's a part of creativeness that is very vulnerable and kind of scary mm. and very hard to kind of like, it's almost like um, when you're like, something's in your, <laughs> to be like very maternal about this, like in your womb, mm. you don't really want to show it yet. Cause it's like this gross kind of like gooey pink thing, yeah. you know, and you kind of want to like have it and then like put it in a pretty bonnet and like give it some like, I don't know, like put a little nose on it. I don't know what people do with babies, but like, you know, you want to like dress it up before you show it to the world. But it seems like with you, you're kind of showing people the the ugly part as well. Yeah. I think there's a lot of value in, in that pink blob. I see how there could be a lot of value for people reading it. How does it give you value as an artist? For one, it's not so dastardly lonely in that process, mm. you know, sit in a, sit in a room with your own creative process. That's a pretty intense room. And if you, if you have a way in which you can share that with other people and invite them into it, that works for you. It's like incredibly rewarding. I love having and running the Patreon. It's like an incredibly immense gift to have somewhere to take that part of me. To be like, hmm. hey, I bought a parachute to use as a huge skirt and I got stuck in it. Um, so that experiment failed. Here's the video. True story. <laughs> Damn, that would be such a good, that's such a good visual. I'm sad that that failed. Yeah, but I know how to do it better now. Nice. Yeah. But we'll see if that one fails. I don't know how many times I'll try this experiment before it fails. It doesn't matter. Do you still consider yourself a circus artist? At the beginning of this call, I said, who are you? What do you do? And you you said you were a performance artist. Uh, it, is, it is an experiment that I think is closer to the truth of the skin that I'm growing into. Um, mm. because I, I mean, I love circus and it's totally got me by the balls and that's just the way things are going to be for this lifetime. And I love that, but there's a lot more. And some of the work that I'm creating right now, it, it wouldn't be very recognizable as circus arts. It's very movement informed, but if you look at it from a stranger's point of view, you feel like that looks like performance art. Hmm. And what is performance art? I don't know, Shannon. What's performance art? <laughs> well, I actually spent four years at New York University studying performance art, so I could tell you all about it, but it's not my interview. Um, <laughs> but I think it's a lot of different things. Maybe the better question to ask you is, um, who are some of your performance art icons, idols? Oh, I just discovered oh, I can't say his name. I'm going to I'm going to botch his name. It's French. Excellent. Uh Olivier de Sagazon, Oliver de Sagazon. You know what? Send it to me. We'll put it in the show notes. Okay. Everyone should go and look at the trailer for his work. And it may be disturbing. But it's just fantastic that's someone that i discovered earlier this year and i was like oh my god this is so great 
it was just so alive and new. The world, I, I know that performance art is a whole huge umbrella and that by bringing even that term into my life, I've opened a large buffet of worms to dance in so, because it's something that I'm still really getting to know. Like I've been living and working as a circus artist for over 13 years. And now I'm like this actually, I feel like we're moving into this kind of direction that I don't know anything about. Cool. Yeah, that is very cool. So I, I can't say that I have all that many influences in it yet because I'm, I'm still trying that skin on. But it feels like a more encompassing term because I, uh -huh. it doesn't feel right to just call myself a circus artist anymore because my interests are are branching. Yeah, totally. I guess, yeah, one of the reasons I guess I am so interested in asking you that is because I'm, I think it's very fascinating that, uh, you know, like when we're little kids and we, uh, people are like, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's like, oh, I want to be a doctor because, by the way, I hate that question. But people are like, I want to be a doctor because their parents are doctors, you know, or like they have someone in their life, they see someone and they're like, oh yeah, that, that looks cool. And I remember, um, being in college and seeing the no fit state and being like, I don't know what that is, but I want to do that kind of mm -hmm. theater. It turns mm -hmm. out it wasn't theater at all. It was circus, you know? And so I was wondering, I guess, in a roundabout way, like who were the people who were like, oh, uh, Rachel, I'm Rachel Strickland and I want to do that. I'm a performance artist. But it sounds like that's not what happened. You're not modeling this kind of career transformation after anyone. No. You're kind of, it's, it's the backwards. It's like you're seeing that the career transformation is happening and you're following it. Yeah. And I'm essentially, <laughs> I'm essentially a lackey for my own imagination. Like what are we doing today, boss? Cool. Let's do that. <laughs> yeah. Which is really all any artist can ask to be. Hey, that's, that's literally the what's happening. Okay. I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but yes, I totally <laughs> think that that's what's happening when, when we set out to make art, a not insignificant portion of that is like, well, what are we going to make? And seeing what rises from the primordial stew. Yeah. This is tricky, right? Because it, it goes against like this whole planning thing that people have where they're like, I want to make this and I want it to look like this and I want it to do this thing. And they get very disappointed when it doesn't happen that way. Or at least I've had this happen before to me. Oh, yeah. It can be super disappointing. You know? Yeah. And sometimes it goes exactly to plan, and that's almost worse. Oh, why? Did you ever... Okay, this is going to sound terribly twisted, but bear with me. Did you ever... I'm here for it. ...have a crush on someone, and you're like, I'm going to seduce that person. And then you did, and they ended up doing exactly what you hoped they would, saying exactly what you hoped they would say. And then, like, you realize that you... You're, you're having the experience exactly as you hoped it would happen, and you're bored. You're like, oh, this is actually kind of creepy and weird. When things Not go exactly time. to plan, it's always like, that was easier. <laughs> Maybe that, that was like creepily easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't allow for a lot of transformation. And exactly. I remember talking to Gypsy Snyder on our episode and she said, oh, what did she say? Art should be transformative, not just for the audience that witnesses it, but for the artist that creates it. Yeah, it's the, the mistakes are just part of the beauty of the process or the ugliness of the process, the value of the process. And if there's no mistakes being made, no rejections happening, then it doesn't seem like risk is being given its due. Yeah. And this is something, I wonder if you have any opinions about this, because I think circus artists specifically have trouble with risk and not, I mean, obviously we're very good at physical risk. Some of us, right? you know, like those who are called to work at great heights or stick their heads in lion's mouths or things like that. Great at physical risk, but emotional risk seems to be a lot more difficult or risk in um, content. 
Can you say that again? Do you know what I mean? Risk and content. Yeah. Yeah. Risk and con- and by content, I mean, it seems like, and when I think about like the worlds of circus and the, the things that I've observed, it's like, there are people who are very much in like the sparkles. And then there are people who are very much in the black booty shorts. And that's circus. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Don't forget the gene. And of course, of course, there are plenty of people who are making all sorts of things that operate in in between. Mm-hmm. But not as many as operate on those kinds of two places. Maybe it's because those two places are are modeled. Like you were mm. saying before, it maybe because it it gives it gives people a skin to try on Mm -hmm. and according to where you are in your development you might need to try on that skin and see how it fits and then that you might grow out of that and become something else yeah it makes sense to me why those (laughs) those two uh, opposing ideals can use that word are so present because they're sure why not they're modeled they're there Hmm. Yeah, and again, I think it's like this idea of like that's what the market kind of sells, right? Because that's what people see. But yeah. There's no primarily. <laughs> yeah, but it sells because it's seen, and it's seen because it sells. And at some point in there, there is room for something new that wasn't there before. Okay, so let's get into this part of it because we've danced around it a bit um, and talked about it a little bit, but the imposter syndrome of it all. I asked you, how did you have the audacity to start the Audacity Project or why are you doing this? (laughs) (laughs) And we all walk around with a little bit of it, whether we are friends with it or not. Um, How do you tell people or how do you help people in the Audacity Project with their imposter syndrome? Is there a one size fits all uh, course of action we could all take? I mean, you hit the nail on the head, really. Uh, Action is- What's that? Action's the best medicine for imposter syndrome. Like there's lots of things. If you look up how do I deal with imposter syndrome on the internet, you will get so much bad advice. You'll get some good advice too, but a lot of it is kind of, I don't know, trite and unhelpful. Like, don't compare yourself to other people. But we're going to compare ourselves to other people. It's a human, a very human instinct to do so. So then you're like sitting in a room trying not to think of pink elephants and all you're thinking about is pink elephants and it's not getting rid of your imposter syndrome. <laughs> so I, I think anything that's, that's more action oriented is more effective in that line of uh, of trying to negotiate with imposter syndrome, like instead of mm-hmm. comparing yourself to other people, becoming curious about the quality of jealousy, for example, which I think is great, mm. great antidote for imposter syndrome. Becoming curious about the quality of jealousy. Can you expand on that? Yes. So, I think jealousy gets a bad rap. And of course, I'm using the term wrong, right? I, what I'm really talking about is envy, as jealousy is a possessive term and envy is a covetous term. I'm talking about envy, but I'm calling it jealousy because colloquially that's. Anyway, nerd moment. <laughs> so, when you experience the feeling of jealousy, of coveting what someone else has, that's like an amazing piece of information. It's. It's like your inner mm. artist and the inner artist is almost, it's always a child, right? It's a child and children like things that are theirs and they like to play and they get jealous really easily. And it's just such a beautifully clean emotion. You're like, oh my God, I'm so jealous. You're like, oh, that's like a really straightforward message from your inner child to you without any debris in the way it's a compass right you're you're seeing something that you desire and sometimes it's really difficult to know what we desire because there's so many obstructions in the way but if you feel jealous of something it's like oh my god 
that points straight back to something that you desire, something that you value. Mm. Becoming curious about the sensation of jealousy. You're like, why am I jealous? What do I, what is it telling me? Where does it want me to go? That I just think is a really nice sort of built-in map. Yes. That's fascinating. I love that. I also like to think that my inner child thinks that she's an adult. She wears like like her mom's high heel shoes and like a big old pearl necklace. I could see know? that. Yeah. In that jacket. That you're like circusy jacket. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm just like, hey guys. Yeah. Oh, you're wrong. Can you be too audacious? Oh, yeah. See, like, that's like my inner child. Like, yeah, completely. Like, it's all just like, like, I want to play dress up. I want to be like, that's why when people are like, your artist is an inner child. I'm always like, no, mine's not. My artist is a grown up. But it's like coming from a very childish place of wanting to be a grown up. I'm having that revelation just now as we're talking. Um, (laughs) That's good. So I I want to I want to ask you a question and then I want to tell a story that is the reason that I'm asking this Fantastic. question. I want to give like a, a a case study for the question. So the question is is it possible or have you ever had someone who is too audacious? And the case study is um a dear friend of mine. Uh do you know Shana Swanson? We've never Loft? had the pleasure of meeting, but we've spoken via the internet. Yes. So Shana, when she was on the podcast, told this story about how she sent probably, you know, like a video every six months to Cirque du Soleil trying to get into the company. Um, And she just wasn't that good. She just wasn't technically that good. And they, and she said she's the only person she's ever heard this happen to. And I've never heard this happen to anyone else, but they actually told her to stop sending them video because she was never getting into Cirque du Soleil. (laughs) I know, which I feel like is like an accomplishment in and of itself in some ways. Yeah. Um, however, if your goal is to get into Cirque du Soleil, maybe that's, it's not an accomplishment. So my question again is like, would you say that Shana Swanson is too audacious? I would not I'd say Shana Swanson <laughs> is the exact right amount of audacious. And I, uh, well, if we can circle back around to like if if all your concept of success is to work for one single company then that's a really dangerous place to be because it defines your success and your value as an artist on someone else's opinion right and like Mm -hmm. i'm there i auditioned for Cirque du Soleil and i didn't work for them either and actually had a very similar piece of feedback like you're just you're you're never going to work here because you don't fit body type for the profile that we need you for and it was a gift so it's kind of like getting told go away we don't want you sucks it sucks but it's also a gift because if they never said that then who knows how many more years you would end up sending videos and flying to vegas or wherever for auditions for someone that wasn't interested like when you're trying to call someone you're crushing on, if they don't like you, they should just tell you, I don't like you, so that you can move on. I was just going to use that metaphor. It's yeah. so good. Mm-hmm. It's so real. Yeah. It's interesting because I think about the Audacity Project as almost, or I, I before this call, and I thought about it almost as like business preparation. Mm-hmm. But the more we talk the more I think it's kind of like artistic preparation in a way. Well, I I feel like they have to be combined because to, to give someone, to give an artist this information and not make it based on and not make it rest on a foundation of what's authentic to them. Mm. Like they really, I don't know how to divorce the two. Yeah. I mean, I guess I could just give, straight up business advice but without without knowing anything about the artist who I'm trying to help that's not helpful I mean it, it's, huh. it could be but to an extent I mean I think it would only be helpful to the people who had the right proportions or who like fit in other ways 
who weren't going to be told no. Right. And everyone's going to be told no, like everyone at some point. It's true. It's true. I get told no all the time. Right. It's not a bad word. I hate it. We have the, uh, like this habit when in the audacity project, like we have a little group, right? And when one of us gets rejected, we like to celebrate and like post a selfie and no. be like, what's up? I got rejected. And everyone's like, congratulations. <laughs> because it's proof of effort and effort is love. Wow. Mm. Am I such a hippie right now? Effort is love. I mean, I'm here for it. You did. Yeah, I said that. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you said that. It and did. it was recorded. It was recorded. That's forever. <laughs> <laughs> so when is the Audacity Project is happening right now? You do four cycles a year of it? You do four, eight week? Is that math? Does that work with it, the calendar? It has worked, but um, this year I'm doing three. Oh, okay. Uh, the the summer cycles waitlisted, but um, applications for the fall cycle will likely open in September. Okay. And yeah. And if anyone is interested, the best way to find out about that is to be on my mailing list. And how do people get on your mailing list? If you are, I know a lot of us are on the gram. If you go to my bio, there's a handy little list of links, and the one at the very top is. Join my email list. Very easy to find. And that's the best place to be apprised of the comings and goings of the Audacity Project <laughs> and tales and fails and whatever else. Whatever else Amazing. is on the docket. Amazing. Rachel Strickland, what advice would you give to yourself at the beginning of your career? I should have known you are going to ask me this. Literally, I ask everyone. everyone this. Yeah. Like there hasn't, I don't. Maybe there's been like one person, but I don't think so. No, you're not crazy. Do it. And also ask the nice people for help. <sighs> <laughs> don't be an island. Don't be an island. That's amazing. Well, Rachel Strickland, thanks so much for coming on the show today. So oh, much fun. I'm so glad we did it and didn't end the way it ended last time, which is we don't know what happened. <laughs> we have no idea. But we were happened. drinking wine in Thailand, so this is better. Yeah, we're both sober. How yeah. cool is that? Yeah. That was my interview with Rachel Strickland. Just to clarify, this is also one of those interviews that we had done about two years ago when we were doing an aerial retreat in um, Thailand, and the result was not good at all, and it got lost, and I'm so glad that we came back together and recorded when we did, because I think both Rachel and I have grown so much in the past two years in our ideas about what art is, how to foster other artists, and I thought she had a lot to say on the topic. I want to be very clear, though, in this outro that I am not attacking anyone who wants to work for the same company for 20 years, and I don't think that Rachel is either. I don't think that either of us, I, I, I guess I can only speak for myself, so I will say I don't believe that there's anything inherently wrong with that. I don't think that that's, you know, like a bad thing if you've done that and if you've loved that. And if that's your experience, go go live your life, like mazel tov. All the joy and power and everything in the world to you. However, it becomes very reductive when the belief is, is that that is the only path of the circus artist. Circus can look so many different ways to so many different people and how to and being a creative in any field. I'm sure that no one other than circus artists listens to this podcast because it's so specialized, but it's true in any field that there's no one way to be a writer. There's no one way to be a musician. There's no one way to be a cartoonist. You know, it can look a thousand different ways, but sometimes taking those first few steps, getting that action, figuring out what she, Rachel says in the interview, she says, what's the next two inches? You don't need to, you don't need a five-year plan but sometimes just figuring out 
those next two inches can be really challenging. And having someone like Rachel, who has something like the Audacity Project, can really, really help you out. So if you are interested in Rachel Strickland herself or the Audacity Project, her Instagram account where she posts very fun, insightful information is um, Rachel Strickland Creative, and that is her website as well, rachelstricklandcreative.com. And as for me, for aerial training tips and inspiration, I'm on Instagram at the underscore artist underscore athlete. My website is theartistathlete.com. On Facebook, I'm the artist athlete. And if you love what you're listening to and you want to see what you are listening to, go to patreon.com slash the artist athlete. You can see video and get so much more. Patreon.com slash the artist athlete. Thanks for tuning in, friends, fans, and foes. I'll talk at you next week. The Artist Athlete Podcast is supported solely by donations from people like you. Here's what some of those people have to say. Hi, my name is Noah and I do hand balancing. Hi, my name is Woody and I do Leo walk. Thank you for listening to the Artist Athlete Podcast. Hi, I'm Freya. You can hear my whole story in episode 50 of the Artist Athlete Podcast, but I'm here to tell you about something else that I do. I'm a qualified health and nutrition coach. I help people with sleep and body confidence, among other things. You can see everything I have to offer at wildguidance.com or follow me on Instagram at wildguidance. Hi, everyone. I'm Dominique, a ground acrobat, trapeze artist, and coach, currently bringing circus to the extremely cold but very beautiful northern Ontario, Canada. Circus has changed my life, and I'm so grateful to everyone in this community. Find me on Instagram at domupsidedown or my website, domupsidedown.com. Aloha, my name is Beth Russell and I live on the beautiful island of Maui, Hawaii. I am an aerial artist and movement instructor specializing in chakra yoga to keep me balanced and grounded. I play with silks, trapeze, lira, rope, acro, aerial yoga and dance, slacklining, pole, bungee and climbing. Really anything that goes up and allows me to explore 3D space. You can find my dedicated aerial page on Instagram at Maui Aerialist. If you find yourself coming to Maui, let's play. Hey there, friends, fans, and enemies. This is Chris Alston, Patreon of the Artist Athlete Podcast. Straps artist and Lyra performer and acrobat out of Greenville, South Carolina. So if you're ever passing through, make sure to stop in and see me and my friends. We have a wonderful space and we'd love to see you. Hi, my name is Erica Lee. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm an aerialist. I teach performing arts to elementary school during the day and do pole and swing and rope by night. I really, really like the Artist Athlete podcast because it gives me a lot of circus goals to look forward to. It gives me a lot of insight on what's going on around the world in circus, and that's why I'm Patreon. Hello, all. Thank you for tuning in to the Artist Athlete podcast. I am Opal Schwartz from Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're ever in the city, feel free to stop by the Aviary Minneapolis. It's a great time. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week and goodbye. Hey there, artists and athletes. This is Andy Smith, owner and artistic director at Saltaire Circus School in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. And I want to thank you for contributing to the Artist Athlete Podcast. If you ever find yourself down in Florida, come check us out. Whether you're an artist, athlete, or someone ordinary just looking to be extraordinary, we have a place for you.